welcome everybody to the St. Louis Park Senior Program Senior Computer Buddies special event. We have a presenter for this edition of Computer Buddies. His name is Steve Anderson and he is going to tell us about MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses. Thank you, Steve. Okay. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm a retired actuary and a retired teacher and so I'm used to standing up and talking to people. I like standing up and talking to people, especially about stuff that I'm, I really like. And so these are massively open online courses. Uh, this is a presentation I gave at a convention a couple, about a year ago. Um, as John said, MOOC stands for Massively Open Online Courses. So let's, let's delve into this and see what MOOCs are. So what is a MOOC? Massively Open Online Courses. Now I could stand up here and talk about it, but one of the nice things about massively open online courses is you can go on the internet and find resources. And so I did that. And here's what MOOCs are. The massive open online course is a response to the challenges in overload. It used to be that when you wanted to know about something, you could do a few things. You could ask someone, you could buy a book, you could try to figure it out for yourself, or you could call a school. If that school offered the course and the thing you were trying to figure out, you could go there and take it. You could get access to information about a topic. An instructor had combed through journals and books to pull the information together from a library. You might even find others who are also interested in the same things that you are. The MOOC is built for a world where information is everywhere, where a social network obsessed with the same thing that you are is a click away, a digital world. A world where an internet connection gives you access to a staggering amount of information. This video will introduce you to how a massive open online course is one way of learning in a networked world. A MOOC is a course, it's open, it's participatory, it's distributed, and it supports lifelong network learning. In one sense, a massive open online course is just that. It's a course. It has facilitators and course materials, it has a start and end date, it has participants. But a MOOC is not a school. It's not just an online course. It's a way to connect and collaborate while developing digital skills. It's a way of engaging in the learning process that engages what it means to be a student. It is, maybe most importantly, an event around which people who care about a topic can get together and work and talk about it in a structured way. But the course is open. All of the work gets done in areas accessible for people to read and reflect and comment on. The course is open in the sense that you can go ahead and take the course without paying for it. You might pay to get the credit through an institution, but you're not paying for participating in the course. It's also open in the sense that the work done in the course is shared between all the people taking it. The material put together by the facilitators, the work done by the participants, it's all negotiated in the open. You get to keep your work and everybody else gets to learn from it. The course is participatory. You really become part of the course by engaging with other people's work. Participants are not asked to complete specific assignments, but rather to engage with the material with each other and with other material they may find on the web. You make connections between ideas and between you and other people. You network. One of the outcomes that people get from the course are the network connections they build up through engaging with each other. The course is distributed. And all these blog posts and discussion posts, video responses, articles, tweets, and tags all knit together to create a networked course. They're mostly not found in one central location, but rather all over the internet in different pockets and clusters. There's no right way to do the course, no single path from the first week to the last. This allows for new ideas to develop and for different points of views to coexist. It also means that one of the side effects of a MOOC is the building of a distributed knowledge base on the net. The course is a step on the road to lifelong learning. MOOCs promote independence among learners and encourages participants to work in their own spaces and to create authentic networks that they can easily maintain after the course finishes. A MOOC can promote the kind of network creation that lifelong learning is all about. The course part is just the beginning. And how can you go about finding one of these? Well, news that a MOOC will be offered usually spreads on online networks. People who have reputations for interesting skills or innovative thinking on a topic decide to collaborate by offering an open online course covering that topic. Anyone who wants to join in can. 
In a MOOC, you can choose what you do, how you participate, and only you can tell, in the end, if you've been successful, just like real life. So, brief history of MOOCs. This all started in 2012, just four years ago. Uh, Daphne Kohler, and I'm going to mispronounce this guy's last name, Andrew Nige, I'm not sure how to say his last name. They're Stanford professors. They had online courses. They're sitting around one day and they said, you know, we, our courses are online. I wonder if anybody will want to watch them for fun. Uh, and so they, they put them out there. Now, as I'll show you with some statistics here, the answer is yes, a lot of people wanted to watch them. And so these are two Stanford professors. Um, they had an, a friend in Silicon Valley who said, yeah, that sounds like a neat idea. I'll, I'll give you some money to get this started. And they started Coursera, and that was the first major player in MOOCs. So there's two Stanford professors started an independent company. Well, Harvard and MIT saw this was going on. Well, we can't get left behind. So they started edX. And an individual by the name of um, Sebastian Thune, who was also a Stanford professor, uh, he started Udacity. Now Stanford looks at all this going on and says, our professors started this, but our name's not associated with it. So they started Stanford Online. And these are all online MOOCs. If you go and you, you Google any, you know, Coursera, edX, Udacity, Stanford, online, you'll come up with a website that you can go to different courses. Now, about this same time, a little bit before, Saul Kahn started Khan Academy. And though not officially a MOOC, it's very much like a MOOC. You can go to Khan Academy and take courses in mathematics and um, started out just as lectures. Now, his goal, and he's backed by this guy named Bill Gates, and Bill Gates went to the guys at Google. and Google, So Google and Bill Gates are both backing Saul Kahn. His goal is to create a curriculum for the entire world. And so that's how this kind of got started. So what are the current, how many current users are there? Uh, when I, I put this together about a year ago, these, so these are probably out of date numbers, I just realized that. Coursera has 17.5 million users. So anybody want to watch this stuff? Yeah, a lot of people wanted to watch this stuff. edX has over 5 million, Udacity has around 4 million. The key point is it's lots of people. And then once one professor you know, was able to talk to his compatriots and go, you know, I had 100,000 people take my course. Oh, well, you know, there's a little competition between professors, but I bet I can get 150,000 to take my So they just, they fall over each other, putting their courses online. Uh, and so just about every major college and university in the world are offering these courses through one of the various um, platforms. So where are the MOOCs? As I said, Coursera was first, edX, Khan Academy, Udacity, now one thing about Udacity, Udacity is solely for programming and systems. Uh, Sebastian Thune um, had originally started out as a Google employee, became a Stanford professor, and now his work in life is to, he runs Udacity, which is trying to train people to be programmers and systems analysts. And he has these things called nano degrees. And if you, you pay $200 a month, you have a professional review your work. If you complete the course in 12 months, they refund half your tuition. And there are certain nano courses, they need employees in these areas so bad, if you complete the course, they guarantee you a job. Uh, now, when you talk about the cost of college, oh, hey, this is an alternative. So, and then there are, Stanford Online is another one, and there, there's, you know, there's something called Schoology, which the St. Louis Park School District uses. Schoology is a platform where if, if anybody in this room wanted to start a MOOC, Schoology is a platform where you can create an online course and make it available to anybody in the world. So there's a, the, the ability of computers to communicate is absolutely amazing. Okay, so what do, math, what do MOOCs cover? And the answer is just about everything. They started out as college courses, so you got math, science, history, English, music, art, language, I mean, it's just about everything. Coursera, edX, and Stanford Online are offering common college courses. Udacity focuses on training for computer services. And as I said before, you complete their nano degrees, which are a number of different MOOCs put together, they guarantee you a job. So how are MOOCs used? Well, they're kind of becoming the new textbook. 
that you know, they're used either as a basis for the course content or a supplement to a course. Uh, I taught in an alternative learning center where I had students who were, had severe uh, academic challenges. And I taught other people who were just brilliant. They just had other things going on in their lives that they couldn't succeed in a regular high school. So I would use these MOOCs. Uh, I had a kid taking calculus. I went to the Ohio State University. They had a wonderful calculus course. And uh, so I, I put him in touch with, you know, let him watch the calculus lectures from Ohio State. So instead of listening to an old actuary give a calculus lesson, he got to listen to a professor at Ohio State University give a calculus. And he said, Steve, I kind of like the guy from Ohio State better than you. Said, okay, that's fine. Um, some schools are giving college credits for MOOCs at their college. So I think it's the University of New Hampshire. They don't have their own curriculum. They use all these other MOOCs. But you take the MOOC, and then University of New Hampshire, I believe it is, gives you credit for completing the courses. So you get a college degree from Harvard and MIT and Stanford and Duke and Oxford and all these other different places. The courses are from there, but the degree would be from a different college. They're also means of lifelong learning. Now, if you can't tell from my enthusiasm. I was explaining this to one of my friends, and he looks at me and goes, Oh, you're one of those lifelong learners, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> and so it, I just, you know, I, I get emails now from the different courses saying, you might like this, you might like that. And so I'll, it's just, it's, if you like to learn, these are just a goldmine. They're also used to determine effective means of pedagogy. So, for example, 5,000 people take a course, one course. 500 other people take another course, and only 500 people complete that course. So they have two courses. One 5,000 people did, the other 500 people did. What's the difference in the course? How come one people were so successful and excited about the one course and didn't like the other? So you can see what's good and, and what didn't work quite so well. And it gives everybody a chance to watch the finest professors in the world. One of the, my favorite courses is called A Brief History of Mankind, 17 Weeks. And it was a professor in, in Israel. Now, so, so here I sit in my man cave in St. Louis Park. And for 17 weeks, I, I get up on Sunday morning. I just, that's how I dedicated Sunday morning. I would watch the lectures from this course. I didn't do any of the assignments. I didn't write anything. You know, I could have. But I just, it was just so much fun to get up and listen to this professor talk about the history of the world. The insights he had were absolutely amazing. You know, when I was in my 20s, that was never a possibility. Now, you can get on the internet and listen to any professor, pretty much any professor from all over the world. So what are the pros of MOOCs? Well, like I said, you have the courses from the finest universities in the world, and they're available to everyone. Now, I took a course on writing prepared by professors at Duke University. And so I have three grandchildren. The question I ask is, do I want my children and grandchildren taking a writing course put together by a full professor from Duke University or a 22-year-old from a local college? I mean, not, not, nothing against the 22-year-old from the local college, but they're not Duke professors. And so the, the ability to get the finest education for free is just amazing. MOOCs are also collecting a max amount of data on what is effective teaching. And I, I, oh, here's a different example of the same thing. 5,000 people take a course. 500 of those people give exactly the same wrong answer. How did 500, you know, it's not everybody. Most of the people got the lesson. But 500 people got the wrong answer on a given course. What did the professor do that caused that many people, although small, but still significant number of people, did something wrong. So they can go in and they analyze, what did I do that led 500 people astray? And then go back and they can fix that. And then, then check the next time the course is taken, did my fix work? And if it didn't, make another fix. And there's no need to reinvent the wheel. As I mentioned, I'm a, I was an actuary first and a teacher second. And my first week in the education system, the inefficiencies in our public education system just drove me nuts. I mean, I don't know. Say we have 4,000 teach math teachers in the state of Minnesota. Every single one of them is creating a lesson on the Pythagorean theorem. How many lessons on the Pythagorean theorems do we need to create from scratch? Khan Academy has a perfectly good lesson on the Pythagorean theorem. 
We should all be using that. It opens opportunity top tier education to everyone. And I've got a couple examples of third world students are watching these online and they're going to they're getting scholarships to the finest schools in the world. I'm not gonna even try to pronounce this guy's name. He's from um, Harvard, Harvard and MIT, and he was, he's the, he created edX. And his pros on MOOCs are, it creates an active learning environment. And so when you take the, like Khan Academy, the students go on, they answer questions, they click enter, they get immediate feedback, was my answer right? And then they use artificial intelligence, based on the answer they give, they can get hints as to, well, here's what it, you did wrong. Um, some of the MOOCs I've taken, you write a paper, and they have software where part of completing the class is you write a paper, and then your, re your responsibility is to review three other people's papers based on a, a rubric that they give you. And so you get, within a couple days, you get feedback on how well you did. Now, what's the quality of the feedback? All depends on who reviews your paper. It could be just total junk. It could be brilliant. You don't know. But you do get immediate feedback, and you can kind of judge yourself. Plus, you judge, they give you a rubric as to here's what it's supposed to be. You can compare it yourself to see, did I do what I was supposed to do? But you get this immediate feedback. It also allows for self-pacing. The classes are all over the place. Some of them, you can start and stop at your own, do, whenever, do it whenever you want. Others are, here's what we do this week, here's what we do this week, here's what we do this week. That week, it's closed and we're done. And so it, they're all over. Gamification is kind of a buzzword in education now. And what, how many people here play solitaire? Yeah. They, they have figured out that when you play these video games and you win a game of solitaire, you get a shot of adrenaline. And so the, the people are studying this. And so they'll, they figure out in the course, OK, if I get this answer right, you get a little prize. And then if I get, they make the next question a little bit harder and I get a bigger prize. And you get, feed, it's, a, it's a feedback system to say, okay, you do well, you get feedback. If you don't, don't, don't do it right, you, get a, you have to go back a few steps. But it makes a, they, there are people who are making games out of the class. And also promotes peer learning where you, there's discussion groups and you get involved with the discussion group and you can discuss the, the items and content that the professors are talking about. Peer learning. I took a course where one of the cons we're going to talk about is really difficult to, to, finish, to finish these things on your own. Um, and so one of the professors that started a MOOC said, okay, we're going to do this together. Eight week course, four times during the course, we're going to meet 10.30 Eastern time, figure it out, we're going to meet all over the world and listen to a lecture. And so during the course of the lecture, it was 90 minute lecture, he'd stop and say, oh, here's, for example, what, what two words would you use to describe global warming? Then he gives us a Twitter feed, and 35,000 people fill in two words for each person as to what they, how they would describe global warming. We have a 15 minute break, his assistants go off, and they put it all into this giant document, and then there's this thing called a word cloud, where the words that are mentioned the most get the largest font. And if the word's mentioned only once, it's there, but it's so tiny you can't see it. So it's a way, I had a conversation with 35,000 people. So it, the, and that's kind of, you know, from all over the world. So it's kind of a neat way to, to communicate. Okay, Daphne Kohler was one of the original starters of MOOCs. And she brought up this, they, they call it the two sigma problem. That if you have a class taught by a regular teacher, regular classroom style, and you take the uh, mean score of that class. Then you take that same class and you have a master teacher. Teach the same class to a different group of people, calculate a mean score. That mean score with a master teacher is one standard deviation higher than just a regular class. If you have an individual tutor to teach the same class, take the average scores of the people who are getting individual tutors the mean score is two standard deviations above the regular class. This is known in the education world as the two sigma problem. Well, what Kohler argues is that the feedback loops that are available with MOOCs, and I would hold up Khan Academy as the perfect example of this, 
using Khan Academy is like having an individual tutor. It's an artificial intelligence individual tutor, but still, it's an individual tutor. And so you get significantly higher scores and significantly higher learning with the artificial, or the artificial intelligence feedback that MOOCs offer. I'm not even going to try to pronounce his name either. He's a young man from Mongolia. He lives in a place where they had high-speed internet. He got on, I believe it was the edX platform. He took one of the edX courses, and the kid's brilliant. And the people at, at MIT were so impressed with him, they said, you need to come to MIT and go to college for free. Now, I gave the, like I said, I gave this presentation at the Minnesota Association of Alternative Programs. And I challenged the two people I presented to. I said, I bet we have brilliant students in Minnesota that if they got on these platforms, and they could show people that, hey, we got really smart people here. And so it's, it's, a, it's really a way to, when I started using computers 40 years ago, it was all about calculations. Now it's all about communication. And so the ability of these platforms to let people show what they know, I mean, it's just, it's amazing. All right, what are the cons of books? They have extremely low, you know, 100,000 people show up, maybe 5,000, about a 5% completion rate. Because, you know, you look at the class and go, hey, this sounds really, I want to take this class. Well, then this comes up and that comes up, and you never get it. And, and even if you, li I listen to a lot of the lectures, but I don't do the homework, and so it shows up that I didn't complete the class. So the, it takes a lot of time, commitment, self-discipline. Honestly, most people don't have to watch these things. Uh, there's also a limited amount of social activity. I use the example of the Duke professors setting up a class. They're going to set up a good class, but Duke professors are not going to know my grandkids from the man in the moon. And so they're not going to be able to give them personal, and you need personal attention. So just because the class is wonderful, there's no, you're basically sitting there with a the computer. There's limited to no social interaction unless you get, take these with a small group like in a place like this. There's a real concern that you're going to have a two-tier education system. That if this really took off, colleges like Luther and Gustavus and St. John's and St. Benedict's, go, hey, we don't even not need to hire professors anymore. We'll just use the professors from MIT and Stanford and Harvard and Oxford, and we'll just have our students come and listen to the lectures. And so you end up with a two-tier education system, one where you have the finest professors, and they're giving everybody lectures, and then you have the schools who are watching students on videos, and th then they hire cheaper professors. Yeah, that might not be the best deal either. I talked about the low completion rate. Let's talk about how much knowledge actually gets spread. And so I made this example. In Ivy League school, they might have 45,000 people apply. 1,500 to be accepted. 95% of those are smart kids that get into an Ivy League school. 95% will probably complete the course. So I have 1,425 complete the course, based on my example. A MOOC, 45,000 people will enroll. 45,000 people will accept. But only 5% complete. The well, that's still two. Th that's, ah, which one's better? So, you know, the... the the low completion rate is a problem, but there's two sides to that coin. There's a, a company that was called Amplify. Uh, Rupert Murdoch, the head of Fox News, hired Joel Klein, the head of, he used to be the head of the New York City schools. And so, so when I heard that Rupert Murdoch, who's not known for throwing his money around and wasting it, hired Joel Klein, who is a very, pretty high-powered guy, they were starting, an, they were, they were going to fix K-12 education. Well, it totally crashed and burned. Um, they're not accepting new clients, and they're looking for somebody to buy them out because it was a total, complete failure. Uh, what went wrong? Well, they went to market without complete curriculum. And so they, they sold the product, and then they go, oh, yeah, we don't have a course on that, and we don't have a course on that. The other thing, the tablets were faulty. And then they, they got into schools, and the schools didn't have the bandwidth that was needed to complete it. So anybody here watch Charlie Rose? at night. He was a couple of years, well, it was about 2013 that he had a high-powered panel on there, and they were going about, MOOCs are going to revolutionize uh, education. And this is, you know, this is the kind of thing that can happen. This was a pretty much a total, complete failure. So what's the future of MOOCs? I found this graph so that you have, whenever some new technology is invented, you have just, oh, this is going to be wonderful. This is, this is better than sliced bread. This is going to be the be-all and end-all for education. And so people's expectations take off. 
And then they see what happens and goes, oh, this doesn't work the way I thought it was going to. And you get into the, the trough of disillusionment. And then so you get down here and you go, oh, well, you know, it may not be everything I thought it was going to be, but it's not all that bad. And so there's this called the plateau of productivity. It took us out of the Wikipedia article on MOOCs. Is that, and then, you know, whatever new technology you enter, you're going to see that kind of, of environment where it's over, over excitement, over expectations, then complete depression that it didn't work the way you wanted to, and then it levels out. So there really are some practical uses for these MOOCs. All right, some teaching fundamentals. Khan Academy math classes are a perfect example of this. We'll teach fundamentals perfectly. And so if you want, and he's working on an entire curriculum, K through 12, for all topics. And so um, that would be a way to teach fundamentals. And it has the artificial intelligence built in. I mean, so he's got about 100 people being funded by Bill Gates and Google. They have all these software engineers with de degrees in mathematics and psychology and, and presentations. They're building an absolutely wonderful system. But he'll be the first to say all it does is teach fundamentals, which is nothing wrong with that. MOOCs also apply, can be used for projects. Because it's just my personal opinion. In education, you need to teach fundamentals. MOOCs will do that perfectly. You need to have projects where you can apply the fundamentals. And MOOCs are a perfect example for that. And then you need to do that within a group where you feel like you belong. Now, MOOCs don't, that's not part of the MOOCs. That's something the users have to say, you know, I really like this MOOC. Say half a dozen people in this room go, let's take a MOOC on whatever. And you can get together and you can form the social bonds to support each other. So uh, I would love to take any questions you may have. Yes. Uh, typically in English language? Most of them are. There are, there are I'd say 80, 90 percent are in English, but there are a num number of MOOCs that are coming out in Spanish and Chinese. Yeah, I kind of backed into MOOCs. I feel that the term is alien to me, but Khan Academy, I've been familiar with. Mm -hmm. And because I've mouthed it back, it's kind of fun to run over. I started at the beginning, and I found the teaching style was really helpful. And, uh, I have since access, I guess you call them MOOCs on literature. I just finished my uh, astronomy. Yeah. Came out of California. Yep. Uh, it's just amazing. I don't compete. I don't. I have no intention of getting the certificates. I want the information, the knowledge, and yeah, it satisfies me. You're one of those lifelong learners too, aren't you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, the, the neat thing about Khan Academy is I would use that for my students who had a, a gap in their knowledge. And the way Khan Academy works is you have to get, for a given topic, you have to get five answers. They give you five problems. You get five problems in a row correct. And you have to do that five times. And on the fifth time, if you don't get the five answers in a row correct, they make you wait 24 hours to do the test again. So you have to show mastery in every given topic. Now, when you've got a high school senior who wants to graduate and he's got to get through 30 topics and they make him wait 24 hours, he gets a little nervous. <laughs> yes? I go to YouTube and for review of math, but what would you do? Uh, the MOOC or Khan Academy for a review of a uh, you just go to Khan Academy, there's a search box, type in the particular topic that you want to on algebra and that lesson will come up. Well, I have a question and it's very elementary, but how would, how would you, you're at your computer, how would you access, say I was interested in checking out this Khan Academy, how, how do you access it? Um, go to Google, type in K-H-A-N Academy. The website will pop up. You click on that. They ask you to sign in with Facebook or an email, and, and there it is. And it's the same thing with Coursera and edX. You just you Google the particular name of the uh, the course, and then the the website comes up. And there's search. You know, there's an index 
showing you can look through all the courses as an index and then there's a search box to search for stuff. Yeah, another good thing on, uh, where you can uh, participate in the group. Mm -hmm. I was reluctant to, in fact, I didn't participate, I just observed, peeked in as it were. I was trying to learn the poem or read the poem uh, Divine Comedy. It just totally escapes me. Yeah, right. And I thought, why in hell I'm not stupid? Why can't I understand what the hell he's talking about? So I, I, when I started reading this, this, other people watching it, and they were dealing with the same problem. Mm -hmm. I, then another student would come in with a different take on it that would make perfect sense. So as a result, the students themselves were really perfect knowledge. I still don't understand the white family. Part of my reason for speaking to this group, and any, anybody gives me a chance to talk about MOOCs, I would think they'd be a wonderful basis for adult education. And if you get, you know, if this group of people is really interested in history, or this people is really interested in, in English, or in, in, you get a, a small group of people together, a, a learning group, and take these, take classes together. Cause, you know, if 100,000 people take the course, it's hard to have a conversation with 100,000 people. Somebody may make a brilliant comment, but finding it in a discussion thread where even 20,000 people made a comment, it's tough to find. But if you've got six to 12 people, people you know, and you're sitting in a, a room here at Lenox or over at the high school, and you, you take the class together, you can work together, and then you can see what other people are doing all over the world. The, the, the ability to learn is, for example, the University of Illinois in Champaign, I think for, they're offering an MBA for $20,000. So if you had a bunch of people, you know, recent high school, recent college graduates here in the St. Louis Park, and six to 12 of them got together and took that course together, then maybe they might find a local professor or retired professor or retired businessman who would help them through the, the, the course. The ability to learn is just amazing. Are there any MOOCs that are uh, famous for being from Minnesota? The University of Minnesota has quite a few MOOCs. The, uh, the professor over there has a course on creativity and uh, I've taken it, I've taken it, it's just, it's fascinating to, to take. So it's, uh, that's, that's the University of Minnesota is the, the, the Minnesota one who's most, most connected to MOOCs. I think, I believe it's part of Coursera. You mentioned taking a MOOC course on a Sunday at a reoccurring time. Are all of them hard scheduled or? Are no, in no. The, you can, I, I just chose Sunday morning because that was a convenient time for me, but you can listen to the lectures <clears throat> any time during the week. And like I said, some courses are scheduled so that this material comes out this week, this material comes out that week. Other courses you can just go on and you can take it at your own pace. There's not one set by the, the class. I didn't bring it up in the um, presentation, but on edX, there's a course called Justice. Um, in fact, a young man who grew up in Hopkins, Michael Sandel, uh, he teaches it at Harvard. It's the most popular course that's taught at Harvard. And it's all about what const what's the right thing to do. And he, it's, he starts out the course with the question of, you're in a trolley car, you're headed down the tracks, you look ahead, and there's five people working on the track. You put on the brakes, the brakes are on. And you realize, well, there's a siding. I can, the steering wheel still works. So I can turn the trolley car into the siding. That siding has one person on it. So if I do nothing, I'm going to kill five people. If I actively turn the steering wheel, I'm going to kill one person. What's the right thing to do? And so that, that, that's the beginning of the course. And so, to, and the other interesting part about this is, he gives the lecture, but it's in a, a lecture hall at Harvard, 
And so you get to hear the students at Harvard answer that question, and they come up with the different, you know, some people say one, some people say the other, and the reasoning they have. So to be able to watch that kind of stuff is, it's, it's just, you know, it's really one of the, the, I don't want to call it miracle, but it's truly one of the amazing things of the Internet. Yep. And so this is an example, this is an example of edX. So you just go to edX and here, visualizing Japan, jazz, the music, the stones, and the players, so AP, Spanish, yeah. Almost any AP class that's taught, there's a MOOC to prepare you for the AP class. Which brings up the question if, if let's see, this is from uh, Boston University. If Boston University has prepared a class for an AP exam, why are high school teachers preparing course, why are they taking the time to prepare a course when Boston, you're, are you really better than, I mean, I, I had a teacher, well, I, I worked in Lakeville, and one of the Lakeville teachers, well, I can teach better than Saul Khan, and I'm going, I didn't say it, but I'm thinking, Saul Khan went to MIT and Harvard, I don't think he went to MIT and Harvard, so, but that teacher is there to have the relationship with the student that Saul Khan can't have, and so it's, MOOCs are just a way of, of transferring information. To make them really work, you've got to create the social aspect of it, too. And the social aspect is local. Now, this, this is the Coursera website. See, they've got business, computer science, data science, life science, math and logic, personal development. One of the courses I signed up for, was, didn't, I never finished it, ran out of time. Um, how to be happy. So, basically, you know, I can't think of a topic that isn't covered by a MOOC at one place or the other. Yes. Yeah, I took a class, I think it might have been school, uh, on the early American poetry, and on, uh, particularly on, uh, uh, well, say Walt Whitman, much others. And they had a certain time that they would do the schedule, but they would fit everything in archivio. You could go back any time. I've gone back, I don't know how many times those courses, you know, was there's long gone. I still have it. Yeah. Yeah. No, no charge. Because yeah. they are trying to figure out how to make money on this. And I know on Stanford Online, they're starting to charge 50 bucks or so. And the, the other thing, I think both Coursera and edX do this. You can take the course for free, but if you pay $35, then they they do some stuff to check that make sure that you're really doing it, and then they give you a certificate that you can then post on LinkedIn to show that you took the course. So, yeah, you know, I, I would challenge some of my students because in an area learning center, my students are probably not going to go to college, but if somebody wanted to be a salesperson, they could get a job where they thought they could be a salesperson. And then they could start taking courses on marketing and operations research. And, you know, I said the University of Illinois is offering an MBA. You have to pay to get the accreditation. But if you just want to get online and take the courses, you could do that. So if you got a half a dozen of your friends together and you took the courses on marketing and operations research and, and all the MBA courses, and then you just go to your boss and, say, and talk to them about what you've learned and say, could you make me an intern in the marketing department? That's, you know, I don't know that anybody that has done that yet, but it's there for the taking if you want to do it. So it's, it, it is a potential answer to the high cost of college. But the, the key here is forming a social group that will support you. Because the chance of one person sitting down in front of the computer, taking all those courses and learning the stuff and then applying it without having it, without working with somebody who knows what they're doing, you know, it's just not going to happen. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Steve, for coming to Computer Buddies and giving us the benefit of your uh, information. Thank you.